The narrative from Western governments surrounding the war in Ukraine is that Vladimir Putin himself started this war because he hates freedom and he wants to erase Ukraine from the map. It is an extremely absurd, simplistic narrative that does not help us to actually understand the geopolitical conflict taking place on Ukrainian soil, which is actually a proxy war between Russia and NATO. And of course, the leader of the NATO military alliance is the United States. Now, you're not allowed to say that in mainstream Western media. They claim that it's Russian propaganda or disinformation. But ironically, a new poll shows that a majority of people in Germany and France, in the heart of Europe, agree with that assessment. A majority of Germans and a majority of French people have said in a new poll that the United States and NATO bear responsibility for starting the war in Ukraine. Now, there were also a lot of people who blamed Vladimir Putin as an individual himself, but they're not the majority. The majority recognize Western culpability for this conflict. However, the reality is that these people in Germany don't actually have influence on their government's policy toward Ukraine because as the extremely pro-war hawkish foreign minister Annalena Baerbock said in a conference in 2022, she said, we have to keep supporting Ukraine, quote, no matter what my German voters think. This is why we made uh, very clear today at uh, our informal council, but also with an input paper um, I gave uh, together with my French uh, colleague, making uh, clear that we stand uh, with Ukraine as long as they need us. But if I give the promise to people in Ukraine, we stand with you as long as you need us then I want to deliver, no matter what my German voters think, but I want to deliver to the people of Ukraine. So in other words, these Western governments are saying that the NATO proxy war against Russia and Ukraine is more important than democracy itself. They claim they're trying to save democracy, but they're actually violating democracy in order to wage this proxy war. And we can see from these polls that many people in Western Europe itself, in NATO countries, recognize that, that Western governments were responsible for starting the war in the first place. And what's even more remarkable about this poll is it was conducted by a vehemently anti-Russian group. This is not Russian propaganda. This is from Western-backed anti-Russia activists acknowledging that across Europe, many people recognize NATO's and Washington's responsibility for this proxy war. One of the most prominent anti-Putin activists in Russia is Alexei Navalny. He has been openly supported by the United States government and by numerous Western European governments for years. He actually got his start as a far-right nationalist and he participated in racist rallies alongside skinheads and fascists. In fact, the Western governments who claim to be so enlightened and progressive and anti-racist, what they don't mention while they heap praise and resources on Navalny is that he started his political career making fascistic far-right ad campaign ads in which he compared Muslim immigrants in Russia to cockroaches and he portrayed them as monsters and he shot them with a gun implying that he wants to kill Muslims. And he also promised that if he came to power in Russia, he would kick out immigrants from the Caucasus, from countries like Georgia, and keep Russia ethnically pure. This is the great Western savior that Western governments, that NATO wants to replace Putin with in Russia, while they portray themselves as progressive and enlightened and anti-racist. But like the neo-fascists and far-right forces in Ukraine, Navalny rebranded and they got strong Western support. Navalny claimed to be a great anti-corruption activist and he is the leader of a Western-backed foundation called the Anti-Corruption Foundation, ACF. 
Now, despite their name, the ACF doesn't really actually focus that much on corruption. It is explicitly an anti-Putin opposition group backed by Western governments. And the title at the top of their website says, Together Against Putin. It has a big photo of Navalny saying the man Putin fears. And then it has a button saying, Defeat Putin. I mean, this, this group is not in any way subtle. It is explicitly a Western-backed group dedicated to overthrowing the Russian government, but it has anti-corruption in its name. Now, today, Navalny's chief of staff is an anti-Putin activist named Leonid Volkov, and Volkov has long been involved in uh, pr promoting neoliberal economics, free market economics, and pro-EU politics. He was a longtime chairman of Navalny's anti-corruption foundation until, ironically, he was forced to resign because he was himself shown to be corrupt. He was involved in corruption. So, I mean, the hypocrisy just speaks for itself there. But he did a long Twitter thread on the 15th of August in which he looked at some new polls that were conducted by this anti-Putin activist group, the ACF. Volkov, Navalny's chief of staff, revealed that they are planning a massive international anti-Putin protest on August 20th, and we wanted to figure out if its message would resonate in the two largest EU countries, Germany and France. And he shared a graphic from this protest, and it says Putin is a killer. So, I mean, again, this is not subtle at all. The website is putin-killer.com. Not in any way subtle. These people are not in any way pro-Russian. This extreme bias shows why it's so incredible that they published this poll that showed that a majority of people in Germany and France recognize that the United States and NATO are responsible for the war in Ukraine. In terms of the poll in Germany, 36% of people said the United States is responsible for starting the war in Ukraine. 15% said NATO is responsible. So together, that is 51%. And if you add in Ukraine, 9% said Ukraine is responsible for starting the war. So that's 60% of Germans who say that the US or NATO or Ukraine are responsible for starting the war. Whereas 27%, just over one quarter of Germans, say that Vladimir Putin was responsible for starting the war. In France, which has the second biggest economy in the EU after Germany, the results were even more critical of the Western powers. 43% of people in France say that the United States bears responsibility. 36% said NATO resp bears responsibility. 19% said Ukraine bears responsibility. And 19% also said that European countries bear responsibility. Now, what's weird about this second poll here of France is that it had multiple choice options, so you, you wouldn't just pick one option like in the German poll. So the German poll sums to 100%, whereas this poll in France actually sums to more than 100% because certain you know French people, when they were taking this poll, they could put multiple answers, not just you know the US or Putin or NATO. But the point is that only 40% of people in France blame Vladimir Putin for starting this war in Ukraine. And again, this poll is from an anti-Putin activist who works for Navalny, who is backed by the West. He is Washington's and Brussels choice to try to replace Putin, to have a regime change operation. And ironically, how did he respond to these polls? Well, he claimed that this is evidence of how successful Putin is in spreading his lies and conspiracy theories in Western Europe. In reality, what this actually shows is how unsuccessful NATO propaganda has been at trying to brainwash everyone in the West and make them believe that this war started on the 24th of February, 2022, because the evil boogeyman Vladimir Putin just wanted to kill Ukrainians and destroy great Ukrainian democracy and all of that propaganda. No, the reality is that all around the world, people can see that this is a proxy war that NATO has been waging against Russia going back years. It did not start in 2022. And now even many people in Western Europe in the heart of NATO 
also recognize that it, it was NATO itself, the Western Imperial powers, that bear significant responsibility for this war. First of all, let's not forget, the war did not begin last year. The war really began in 2014, when the United States sponsored a coup that overthrew Ukraine's democratically elected president, Viktor Yanukovych. Now, Western media outlets constantly claim that Yanukovych was pro-Russian, but in reality, he was neutral. He was geopolitically independent. He didn't want Ukraine to be a Western puppet, but he also didn't want it to be a Russian puppet. But he was overthrown, and th this was in the so-called Euromaidan protests that were started in late 2013 because Yanukovych rejected negotiations with the European Union for a trade agreement in which the EU demanded that Ukraine impose neoliberal structural adjustment policies, the kinds of right-wing economic policies that the US-controlled International Monetary Fund, the IMF, and the World Bank constantly impose on countries around the world. Yanukovych said, no, this is not acceptable. And instead, he looked toward Russia for a trade agreement that was more favorable. It's not because he was a Russian puppet. It was because it was a more favorable economic agreement that didn't require him to implement mass privatizations and cut social spending and sell off Ukraine's assets to Western corporations, which, by the way, is exactly what is happening now. Zelensky, the NATO proxy, is selling off Ukraine and he is ringing the bell in, in the morning on Wall Street symbolically, at least virtually, at the New York Stock Exchange and selling off hundreds of billions of dollars of assets in Ukraine for pennies on the dollar to Western corporations. It is obvious that American business can become the locomotive that will once again push forward global economic growth. We have already managed to attract attention and have cooperation with such giants of the international financial and investment world as BlackRock, JP Morgan and Golden Sachs, such American brands as Starlink or Westinghouse have already become part of our Ukrainian way. And everyone can become a big business by working with Ukraine. In all sectors, we are defending freedom and property. This is exactly what the NATO powers have wanted to do in Ukraine, to exploit Ukraine's resources, its geostrategic location, to try to weaken Russia right in its most precarious spot, right in the most dangerous spot for Russian security. So the point is, is that in 2014, the U.S. ambassador was recorded in a phone call with the top U.S. diplomat from the State Department, Victoria Nuland, who was the Assistant Secretary of State for Eurasian Affairs. And in this phone call, the U.S. ambassador and this top State Department official are discussing who the future leaders of Ukraine would be after the Washington-backed coup overthrew Yanukovych. What do you think? Uh, I think we're in play. Good. So uh, I don't think Cleach should go into the government. I don't think it's necessary. I don't think it's a good idea. I think Yats is the guy who's got the economic experience, the governing experience. He's, he's the guy, you know, what he needs is Cleach and Tony Book on the outside. He needs to be talking to them four times a week. Yeah, no, I think that's, you know? I think that's right. Okay, good. Well, do you want us to try to set up a call with him Here's the next step? Victoria Newland, the notorious neoconservative diplomat, who was recorded in that phone call discussing their U.S. plans for after the coup in Ukraine, she was brought back by the Joe Biden administration. And by the way, when she was in the Obama State Department, she was actually physically in Ukraine during the coup and the so-called Euromaidan protests, and she was handing out cookies to the anti-Russian protesters, pro-Western protesters. I mean, she was physically involved in the coup. And then the Biden administration brought back Victoria Nuland, and originally she was third in command of the State Department, but this year, in 2023, she was actually promoted in July to the second in command of the State Department. She is Deputy Secretary of State. The only person in the U.S. State Department with more power than her is Antony Blinken. And they are the same neoconservative war hawks who were overseeing this policy of trying to encircle and isolate and overthrow 
the Russian government. That's their goal. It's regime change in Russia. President Biden actually admitted this in a speech that he gave in Poland. He said that they will ne there will never be peace with Russia until President Putin is removed from office. And it was that coup in 2014 that resulted in this war that we're seeing today. There was a, a lower scale war, a civil war, that, that at least ostensibly civil war that started in 2014, but it was actually a proxy war. And there were pro-Russian separatist forces in the eastern of Ukraine who obviously they supported Russia and they welcomed Russian support, but they were also responding to the brutal policies of the Ukrainian regime after the coup, which implemented anti-Russian policies. And of course, when we're talking about the eastern parts of Ukraine historically, these are areas where people were ethnically Russian. They were Ukrainian, they had an Ukrainian nationality, but they were ethnically Russian. They spoke the Russian language and their rights to speak Russian the, the rights of having Russian language textbooks in schools were being revoked more and more by the pro-Western regime in Ukraine, which, by the way, after the coup was led by the billionaire oligarch Petro Poroshenko, who also implemented many of these right-wing neoliberal economic policies, and he pledged that NATO would become a member of NATO, the U.S.-led military alliance, and implemented also extreme anti-communist legislation, making it illegal to be a communist, banning the communist parties. His regime even made it illegal for leftists in Ukraine to sing the famous song of the, the international left, the, which is called the Internationale. And the, you can be imprisoned in Ukraine for singing this left-wing song. That was before Russia invaded, well before. And by the way, since the Russian invasion, now Zelensky has banned all of the communist and socialist parties that were remaining. So, I mean, Ukraine has been this authoritarian right-wing regime full of far-right extremists going back to the 2014 coup. These were the people that the West backed in order to fight this proxy war against Russia and the pro-Russian separatists in the East. And according to the United Nations, not according to a pro-Russian source, according to the UN, from 2014 until the end of 2021, Two months before Russia invaded Ukraine, of course, Russia invaded in February of 2022. Before that, from 2014 until the beginning of 2022, 14,000 Ukrainians died in this proxy war that the West was fueling constantly using these far-right forces to fight against pro-Russian separatists in the eastern part of Ukraine in the Donbass region. And by the way, according to those UN statistics, the majority of civilian casualties were actually in the Donbass region. That is to say they were ethnically Russian Ukrainians who were killed by the Western-backed Ukrainian forces. Now, all of this history has been conveniently erased, and we're supposed to believe that this war was simply caused because Putin bad, Putin hate democracy, Putin authoritarian. I mean, this insanely ridiculous, simplistic narrative that we're always being fed by Western governments and their stenographers in corporate media outlets. But honestly, just going back to 2014 is not enough to understand this conflict today. We have to go back even further. Ukraine had been part of the Soviet Union. And after the overthrow of the Soviet Union, the Western back regime change in 1991, Ukraine had a series of different governments. Some of them leaned toward the West, some of them leaned toward Russia. And in 2004, there was another soft coup sponsored by the United States. And actually, the establishment mainstream British newspaper, The Guardian, boasted about this in 2004 in an article titled, U.S. Campaign Behind the Turmoil in Kiev. This is about how Washington helped back a regime change operation in Ukraine in 2004 to overturn an election, the results of which it didn't like, and instead put into power a pro-Western puppet. And The Guardian wrote very clearly, the regime change operation or, or the color revolution, it was known as the chestnut revolution. This is one of the classic color revolutions. Quote, the campaign is an American creation, a sophisticated and brilliantly conceived exercise in Western branding and mass marketing to salvage so-called rigged elections. That is to say, overturn election results you don't like. 
and topple unsavory regimes. It was funded and organized by the US government. I'm, again, I'm quoting from The Guardian. This is the most mainstream newspaper in the UK. It, this color revolution in Ukraine, quote, was funded and organized by the US government, deploying US consultancies, pollsters, diplomats, the two big American parties, and US non-government organizations. The Guardian referred to it as engineering democracy through the ballot box and civil disobedience. Engineering democracy. So this is an example of how this hybrid war against Russia in Ukraine goes back decades, not even just to the 2014 coup, but also to the 2004 coup, and even before. And one of the other main points that we have to discuss is NATO expansion. Numerous documents from Western governments show that in 1990, the US, the UK, France, and Germany all promised Moscow, that is the Soviet Union at that time, the Western powers all promised Moscow that if it allowed Germany to be reunified, East and West Germany, then they would not expand one inch to the East. A document from the British National Archive admits this, it proves it, it's very clear. A US scholar found the, this document and it shows minutes of a meeting that was held in 1991 between the US, the UK, France, and Germany. And in the, the minutes of this meeting, they said very clearly that there was, quote, a general agreement that membership of NATO and security guarantees are unacceptable for countries to the east of Europe. It adds that the Western diplomats had, this is a quote, Quote, we had made it clear during the two plus four negotiations that we would not extend NATO beyond the Elba. The Elba is, of course, the river that runs through Germany and Central Europe. And when they say they wouldn't expand east, they, they mean they wouldn't add countries like Poland. And what did they do? They added Poland. They added more than a dozen new countries, all of which were to the east of Germany. Joe Biden himself, before he became president, Back in 1997, he admitted that if NATO kept expanding to the east up to Russia's borders, it would provoke a, quote, hostile reaction. The one place where the greatest consternation would be caused in the short term for admission, having nothing to do with the merit and preparedness of the country to come in, would be to admit the Baltic states now in terms of NATO-Russian, U.S.-Russian relations. And if there was ever anything that was going to tip the balance were it to be tipped in terms of a vigorous and hostile reaction, I don't mean military, in Russia, it would be that. Western government officials have known this for decades. It is not Russian propaganda. They have admitted it in private often, sometimes in public, but mostly in private. We know that because of a 2008 embassy cable that was released by WikiLeaks, thanks to journalist Julian Assange, who's now rotting in prison as a political prisoner for the supposed crime of exposing US crimes around the world. I wrote an article about this, which I'll link to in the description below over at geopoliticaleconomy.com. And it looks at this 2008 embassy cable written by the then US ambassador to Russia, William Burns. Today, William Burns is CIA director. So this is someone who is one of the most powerful people in the US government. And back in 2008, he published an internal embassy cable, it was confidential, titled Niet means Niet, which is no means no, Niet is Russian for no, Russia's NATO enlargement red lines. And he said very clearly, Foreign Minister Lavrov, that's the Russian Foreign Minister, and other senior officials have reiterated strong opposition, stressing that Russia would view further eastward expansion, that is of NATO, as a potential military threat. This is the US ambassador to Russia writing in an internal embassy cable in 2008. And William Burns, current CIA director, he wrote back then, quote, in Ukraine, that is the fears of NATO expansion, quote, in Ukraine, these include fears that the issue could potentially split the country in two, leading to violence or even some claim civil war, which would force Russia to decide whether to intervene. This is exactly what has happened. It caused a civil war and Russia supported the pro-Russian forces and NATO 
flooded the country with weapons and caused this war that has been destroying the country of Ukraine. U.S. officials have known this for decades, and yet they continued expanding NATO to surround Russia because that's their goal. Their goal is overthrowing the Russian government and resubordinating Russia like it was in the 1990s when it was basically a Western puppet run by the alcoholic Boris Yeltsin who implemented neoliberal capitalist shock therapy. He sold off all of Russia's assets to, to oligarchs and to Western corporations. That's what the Western capitalist powers want Russia to be. They want it to be a gas station. In fact, it was the notorious neoconservative Republican Senator John McCain from the United States, he famously said that Russia is, quote, a gas station masquerading as a country. That's how these Western imperialists see Russia, as a gas station. They want to exploit, steal its natural resources, and prevent it from challenging their hegemonic dominance over the world. It's, it's really that simple. And this is a bipartisan policy. It's not just the Democrats who are in power in the United States right now. I mean, right now, of course, Biden is flooding Ukraine with weapons, but let's not forget Donald Trump, his Republican predecessor, sent lethal weapons to Ukraine that even Obama didn't send. Of course, the Obama administration helped oversee the 2014 coup in Ukraine, but Obama refused to send lethal weapons. He, instead, he sent so-called non-lethal military equipment, which is, you know, euphemism to Ukraine. But then Trump came in and Trump sent lethal weapons to Ukraine. In fact, Trump even boasted to Zelensky, he said that Obama just gave you pillows, whereas I gave you anti-tank weapons. So, I mean, this is completely bipartisan. And ironically, many Democrats tried to portray Trump as a Putin puppet or in sympathetic to Putin or whatever, but actually he voluntarily surrounded himself with neoconservative war hawks like Mike Pompeo, his CIA director turned Secretary of State, like his national security advisor, John Bolton, and they destroyed all of the remaining arms treaties that the United States had with Russia, including the Intermediate Range Nuclear Forces Treaty, the INF, that was destroyed by the Trump administration, including the Open Skies Treaty, that was also destroyed by the Trump administration. So the Trump administration continued this policy that is now being expanded by the Biden administration. And in late 2021, the Russian government sent a series of demands for security guarantees to the United States, the European Union, and NATO, saying, we demand these security guarantees. Ukraine cannot join NATO. Ukraine cannot have nuclear weapons, et cetera, et cetera. And what was the response of the Western powers? They all said no. They said, screw you, Russia. We're not going to agree with you on anything. At every single step on the escalation ladder, going back decades, the United States, NATO, and the EU, even before the EU existed, these Western countries have escalated the aggression against Russia, pushing it into a corner, and then it invaded Ukraine, and they act as if it was something they would never have imagined in a million years, and it's all because Putin is a crazy, evil madman. I mean, that's the context that we're never allowed to hear in Western corporate media. But the reality is that many people, even in the heart of NATO, in Germany and France, can see clear, they can see through this, this propaganda that is constantly fed to us in the, in the corporate press, which just acts as, you know, the propaganda mouthpieces, the water boys for NATO. Despite all of their propaganda, the majority of people in both Germany and France recognize that the United States and NATO bear responsibility for starting this war, which did not begin with the Russian invasion. It goes back many years, and it is NATO principally that is the culprit. That is not so-called Russian disinformation. That is the uh, objective reality. And many leaders across the Global South have said this. Many people in countries across the Global South have acknowledged this. This is why two former US government officials published an article in Newsweek complaining, quote, nearly 90% of the world is not following us on Ukraine. They point out that 87% of the world's population lives in countries that have refused to back the West in this proxy war on Russia. This is the majority of the world population. These are the people who live in the global South. For them, it's been completely obvious that NATO and the US bear responsibility for this war. And now, even in Western Europe itself, a majority of people, at least in Germany and France, 
are acknowledging this fact according to polling done by anti-Putin activists. This is the situation we're in today. It's quite remarkable. With that, I'm going to conclude. I'm Ben Norton. This is Geopolitical Economy Report. I want to thank everyone who joined me. Please subscribe on whatever platform you're watching or listening on. If you're on YouTube, please subscribe and like the video. It helps to promote our reporting in the algorithm. Every video is also available as a podcast. If you're listening, please subscribe to the podcast to get all new episodes. If you want to help sustain the work that we do here, please consider going to geopoliticaleconomy.com slash support. There are several ways you can donate. The best way is you can go to patreon.com slash geopolitical economy and become a patron and you'll get access to all of our material and um, some early access as well. And this is really important because we don't have any institutional support. We don't have any big donors. We're completely independent. We rely entirely on small donations from viewers and listeners like you. So I want to thank everyone for joining me today. I'll see you next time.